I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so like he said, I'm Rob from Sparkbox. Um, we're up in the wonderful north of Dayton. Uh, and we're going to talk about kind of performance in a responsive world and what kind of changes and challenges and ways that we can address some of those things in this brave new world that we call responsive web design. Um, throughout the presentation, you'll see these little icons that I've added in. That means that I've got a ton more to say on that particular topic that I don't have time to get into during this presentation. This has kind of become a Sparkbox thing. Any of the presentations any of the Sparkboxers give, you'll see this beer icon throughout. We really don't drink a beer for every one of those because that would be really bad. We're not trying to encourage that, but we do love to talk about this stuff and we can do it a lot. So, you know, this is also a presentation I gave at CodeMatch this year, so there is some things in that we're going to have to kind of work around. But, you know, just as a show of hands real quick, how many people would consider themselves like front-end devs in the room? Okay. How many people like project managers, content people, or anything else? Let's see. All right. I love my content people. And I'm assuming everybody else is more back-end devs. Um, yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about me so I can give you a background of who I am and kind of what I bring to the table. Um, I started my career uh, back in the early 2000s and actually um, spent about six years working up at LexisNexis, that great big building you drive by at 675. Um, did a bunch of things there. Got involved with performance and security. I was a security architect there for a couple years and kind of worked on all their security projects, um, 5A data, yay. Um, and after that, I, me and my best friend left Lexus together to go and work for a company out of Jacksonville, Florida. And we worked for the largest seller of banking software in the world. And I've got some really interesting stories that we can talk about sometime if you want to know about really crazy bugs that happens with your money. Um, but essentially, since we were running the team down there, we were given the task to give ourselves titles. Um, and one of the things that we came up with was senior software performance architect. And we were actually trying to find a way to put the word consultant in here as well, but it wouldn't fit on the business card. So this kind of taught me really two important things. You know, one, people call themselves whatever they want. And two, you don't let engineers give themselves titles. So um, that's kind of, so I did that for about two years and I traveled all over God's green earth. It was kind of a crazy job. Um, I was basically a glorified firefighter. On the Friday, on Fridays, I would either get a call at noon or not, and that call would let me know if I was traveling the next week to a client that I had never seen or never heard of before. And if I were to show up, if I, they got the call, I'd get a little brief that said what the problem they were experiencing and who I was supposed to meet and what time I was supposed to be there. And my next call would be to the travel agent to figure out how I was going to fly, you know, oftentimes across the country to get there. And then I'd show up and then they would yell at me because our company hadn't fixed their problem in six weeks and I was the reason, that was the reason I was showing up there. And I basically got yelled at by every level of anybody you can imagine at the bank. And I got kind of callous doing this because they would start yelling at me and eventually I got to the point where I would just respond as like, listen, I get paid the same hourly rate if you want to yell at me or if I'm working on your problem. What do you want me to do? And they would just look at me and then I'd go off and do that. But anyway, after about two years of that, um, we started actually the predecessor to Sparkbox, which is Forge, which grew into Sparkbox. And we've been doing that for almost five years now. Um, yay, we made it to five years. So let's see if we can make it to six. Uh, <laughs> things are looking good on that, by the way. Um, we are in Dayton. And you know, it's, I'm sure you guys get that all in Cincinnati, too. But it's amazing to me when we travel the country and go to conferences and speak. And people say, "Is where are you from? Dayton. You guys do websites there? And you guys do tech? Yeah. Who do you work with? Well, a lot of big companies. And really, in Dayton? Well, yeah, I know we're not on the coast and all that stuff. So what I like to say about Dayton and Cincinnati that I've learned from my friends in Pittsburgh, because we went to Pittsburgh uh, last year, and I made the mistake of calling them the Midwest. Pittsburgh is not the Midwest if you've ever, they do not want to be part of the Midwest. So what I've decided to call you know, Ohio is we are the east coast of the Midwest. <laughs> so um, just one more little thing about, a couple of things about me. Um, this is me and my business partner. We kind of run Sparkbox. Um, we did a spirit week this past year, and we had to dress up as our favorite characters, and I found these awesome um, heads my mother had made when I was a little kid that still were, they're, they're felt and they're 3D and they're amazing. Um, 
And one of my favorite hobbies is obviously smoking meat. Uh, if you guys want to talk about smoking meat and how to prepare things, I will talk your ear off. I, about every weekend, we're doing something at home. Um, so let's kind of talk about what is performance. And this is an important part of this conversation because I think there's lots of different overloaded meanings of this. We can talk about, well, what's it take on the server? What's it take, you know, um, how long is it usable? What's this stuff? And the best definition that I've ever found and that actually translates pretty well to how clients want to talk about it is what I like to call key to glass. What's the perceived performance? How long until I touch something before I can interact with it? What's the feedback loop? That's what clients and people or users of these things really care about is how quick can this get back to me? Not that how big the page is. The page can be 10 meg. If we don't do all that up front, it's perfectly fine. There's problems probably, but the clients, the users don't have to care. So if we talk about a simpler time and we go back, you know, several years, we can kind of look at, you know, where we were. And we were doing just basic stuff. And for the most part, we just didn't care about performance because what was happening at the time is the browsers were getting faster, the pipes were getting bigger, and we just kept building bigger and bigger and bigger and better. And what something really interesting happened during this time is the screens got smaller. The pipes, while your 3G connection probably is as fast as it was before, it's changed what you can actually push through it. So we kind of get back to this basic question, is performance important? And you know, obviously, yes, right? I think we all agree with that. We hear it all the time. Um, and then the next part is, is you know, has responsive web design made performance worse? And I, I think the answer is yes, but it's nuanced. It's not worse because responsive web design, the techniques made it worse. It's worse because one, we were bad at them, two, the same people who were tackling responsive web design were also pushing the borders with CSS and pushing the borders with um, fonts and also tackling these high-res images for all these wonderful devices we have now that can render this. So the same people who were doing and pushing the borders with RWD were pushing the borders with all these other things that made file sizes just explode. Um, you know, and it's just crazy because we kind of jumped into responsive web design without thinking about the impacts of everything. Um, so I, I just want to say, you know, this is completely our fault as an industry. We didn't care. We didn't pay attention to it back in the day. And now that we're tackling all these things at the same time, this is our faults. So let's just look at some statistics here. And, you know, the average page weight is increasing by 32% in 2013. That's nuts to me that we're actually still making things bigger. Um, you know, and I don't know if anybody has seen the Media Queries site. Um, back a couple years ago when RWD first dropped, this was the, the gallery to be in, right? Um, this is where all the top people doing RWD and all the um, innovation was kind of happening and being displayed here. And, you know, the 86% of those sites had the same load time between 300 and 1,200 pixels. That's crazy to me that you're trying to cram the same images and page weight from this size all the way up. Um, you know, Scott Geal has a wonderful blog post where he talks about responsive and responsible and where he talks mostly about making good decisions about how that, and I highly recommend you read that. Um, and the other thing, just talk about pixel density. This is some of the stats of some of the devices that are out there now, and this is actually a little bit old. There's actually ones that even push this closer to 500 pixels to, for PPI. And it's just insane to think that you can have that level of clarity on these really small devices. It's this weird paradigm we're into where the smaller the device and the less that they can digest at once, you can cram more pixels and more beauty into than these wonderful, you know, 27, I have a 27 inch Apple monitor, you know, in my office that I love to death. But it's crazy to look at my you know, MacBook Pro, which is a retina, which is like it's more crisp. I look at my iPhone. It's got even more pixels per square inch on that. The level of detail on these small devices, it's so tempting just to cram things in there. So I think we really need to get back to the basics. What makes something fast? So the things that were important before RWD are still the most important things. Um, and those things are, you know, in no specific order, 
What's your server time? Number of requests. Total downloaded size of the required assets. And then the rendering of your CS, the rendering of the CSS and your JS and NITs. These are called the blocking events that your browser is going to wait for. So Steve Souders had a great quote that I'm constantly coming back to is, is the fastest HTTP request is the one you're not making. And when you start boiling HTTP requests down on mobile, it takes more time than it does on your desktop. You're doing your DNS lookups. It's not that 3G, once you get the download time started, is slower. It's the fact that your latency doubles or triples and that you have to go out and do your DNS lookup. That's a latency call. Go out and make the actual request. And some of the things that we thought were really good ideas for a performance point of view actually turn out to be things that are actually harming us. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. You know, obviously, one of the worst things we can talk about, and I'm sure everybody in this room has dealt with this, is server time. Um, we're not going to talk about server time today because we're going to talk mostly about the front end stuff. But you know, the, the numbers we're seeing now is you want your server time to come in between 2 and 300 milliseconds. And that's it. That's all you get on the, on the server time. Um, and that's, that can be a challenge depending on what kind of data you're crunching and your framework and all those other things. So I really think that what we need to do is change the way we work. Um, and the first step is, is to actually start caring. If we start caring about performance, we can be intentional about the decisions we make. It's amazing to me that I look back at my career and even things that I was doing before, that once I realize why I was doing it and being intentional about it, it changes your perspective. It allows you, allows you to understand and make better decisions. And the other thing we want to do is not blame the technique or the tools. This is an implementation problem. It's not RWD. RWD is a technique to solve a problem. We want to show similar things across screen widths and show beautiful screens. It's kind of like uh, if you were to give me a hammer and saws and ask me to build a table and give those same tools to a carpenter, I guarantee my table is going to look like crap and his is going to be gorgeous. And it's nothing to do with the tools. It's about the craftsman who's wielding those tools. So what all this means is I think we have to change our process. Um, probably in this room, but this is kind of how we all started working on websites. You know, um, it's pretty flat. And you, know, you would do your content work. If you were smart, you would do your content work up front. Then you do your user experience, and then on down the line. And then eventually, when I first started getting involved with performance, what happened was is somebody would come along after the launch and say, make it fast. And I'd be like, OK. And I'm the back end guy. That's who I am. I'm the, and I would be like, all right, I'll make it fast. And eventually, I got asked to make it fast so many times. And it was so painful to do it after it launched that we just moved that little step before launch. And you know, we all realized pretty quickly that this just doesn't work. So we kind of get into this. This is kind of what we call a spiral. Um, this is kind of a. I don't want to call it agile, but it's, <laughs> it's a way to move through the process. And what essentially we do is we go through and we look at all the deliverables and we try to get all the different disciplines involved at each phase in the project. And you eventually follow this black line around <coughs> and you have different deliverables and you're getting input from across the team. And essentially what I want to stress is that performance is everybody's job. It goes from the front end which is obvious to the back end, to the content people, the UX and the design. How many performance decisions are made in the design phase? And one of the things that it's funny, like our designer always gives me crap and he's a great guy and he's a wonderful designer. And he's always telling me is that I'm driving design decisions from a back end perspective. And I always go back and say, no, 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 no. I'm trying to get everyone to think about performance. You have, we have, Oh, we have this much budget. How much are you going to spend? What decisions you're making now do I have to undo later? Or do I have to have hard conversations with the client to say, as well, you approved the design that's got a hero slider with 15 images in it. And you decide to put two mag images in each one of those. But, and I, I'm, I'm really comfortable having those conversations with our creative director because conflict doesn't bother me at all. Um, that's just kind of who I am. But, Essentially, we need to invite everyone into this process. And this will allow the entire team to focus performance in every step. Um, and you know, if we get right down to it, 
performance really is about user experience. And this is more important than ever. You have approximately two seconds to grab someone's attention once they land on your site with your hero and to get them interested. If they decide to stick around for those two seconds, you get approximately four more seconds to show them something of value. Or if they're anything like me, I'm gone. I'm a hyper clicker when I browse the web. I'm like, OK, does this have what I want? Nope, I'm going off to the next thing. I'll go find the next Google result. And that's a big deal for our clients. And the question we have to ask ourselves, if we're not willing to value our user's time, then somebody else might be willing to. And that's a big deal for my clients, and I'm sure everybody who does any kind of clients or the business they work in. So what we want to say is we want to make it feel fast. We want to take little steps to make it feel fast. And I like to call this the perceived performance. And one of the ways that we do this is we come up with what's called a performance budget. We look at all the assets we're going to download and make trade-offs, because you can't have it all. Um, and this is really important, because you can make decisions all throughout the process that chip away at this budget. And if you actually define a budget up front, you can say, well, OK, you want to add this now. What are you going to take away? You can only spend this much. Um, one of the things that I'll caution you is this is not a one-size-fits-all budget. Um, this is Different sites have different, pers different perspectives, have different needs, um, have different requirements. And they don't all need to light the world on fire. Um, there's an example I'll show later that we worked on a long form article for this guy who was doing a year long reporting journey through Missouri. And he went out and wrote these long form articles with these giant images. But it took about 20, 30 minutes to read each one of those articles. Once you got there, it was OK to give people those big, beautiful experiences because they added to the content. There's other sites that y it doesn't make sense. You want to your, get them to the call to action very quickly. And the other thing is you have to take the time to test performance. This has to be a priority. So well, let's talk about some good ideas. And I am anti-prescriptive solutions. I, I just, just hate them. Because if there was a prescription, we would all just do it. There's a million nuances with everything we do. And this is no exception. That what really I think the, the course of somebody working in this industry is to walk through, to learn a bunch of things, and to have these things in their utility belt that they can pull out and be like, ah, this is the right time to apply this. This is the wrong time to apply this. I think it can be really easy to be a beginner and hear somebody say, always do this, and then you walk around with that hammer and just smack things with it. So this isn't the obvious one. Let's decrease the number of requests. It's simple. Let's combine things. Let's put our CSS at the top and our JavaScript at the bottom. Now, there's actually some exceptions to this rule. Anybody that's working on some of the apps we're working on today. But when in doubt, the bottom is not a bad place for it. Obviously, we want to concat and minify all our CSS and JavaScript. Let's get those down. There's no reason that we can't, with the preprocessors and all these things we use, that they can't be as small as possible and still be able to be maintained and worked on and stored in our source control however we'd like. Um, how about we optimize and cut out images? Um, there are some really good techniques that we can use, compressive images, um, that will actually allow us to reduce their file size by about 30% if not more. And what all compressive images is, is you blow it up to twice the resolution on your screen, and then you set your, um, what is it in Photoshop, the, the quality way, way, way down. And by blowing it up to twice the size, it reduces the size significantly, and it still works great on retina screens. Um, if you want to check that out, the Filament Group's done a wonderful write-up about that with some great examples. We've used that extensively on our sites and gotten some major wins out of it. Um, icon fonts, this is something that you can get with one file. You can use them over and over and over again. There is some, a little bit more markup required, and there's some on win Windows phones and some older IE, they don't work as well. But with good front end Kodi, we can code around those kinds of things. Um, and also, picture fill is, this is the, um, one of the new specs that's being written for HTML5 for images, and it looks a lot like the video tag 
and it allows us to specify different images for different viewports. And the thing with images on our websites, when you start talking about screens that are this big, is a different crop may be more appropriate to convey your idea, right? There's a, it, you know, when you're on um, a desktop or a laptop, these beautiful images, but when you have less real estate, you need to get to the point to be able to convey the same message. Um, sprites, um, these are a wonderful, wonderful tool, and something like Compass or Bourbon actually does automatic spike sprite generation for you, and it'll take care of all of the rough edges about building sprite sheets. I remember back in the day building sprite sheets and having to hand build them and know exactly what coordinates and how that took way too much time. All that's gone with these tools now. You can basically, it'll build the sprite sheet dynamically during your asset compilation and plug in the right coordinates for your, your CSS to work correctly. Um, and there is no reason that we shouldn't all be using gzip on our servers that I can think of. It's faster. It's going to help. Just turn it on. I, I, you wouldn't believe how many times I sit down with clients, even prospective clients, they're like, hey, how do I make my things faster? And it's like, well, you could minify your stuff, you could do gzip, and it's just, you know, they walk out of the room before even we've signed a contract and they have some ideas that they can chew on. Um, you know, there's several other things that you can look at. Um, if you're ever in a meeting with a client and they're starting to ask how they can make things better, two words of wisdom. Look for their sitemap and look for their robots.txt file. You wouldn't believe how many clients come in that say, the search engines aren't finding me and they're blocking everything on the robots.txt <laughs> or they have no sitemap and it's like, well, if you make these, you make this one character change, everything will work. And they're like, oh, and those people almost always sign. Um, obviously, cache all the things. There is no reason you shouldn't be caching all the things. And one of the things that we've used to talk about with caching it, that was actually problematic is, well, if I cache them too long, what if I change my assets and all of those? And one of the things that kind of came to precedent with you know, um, Rails that we get for free in the asset pipeline, but you can also build into any other tool you want, is this idea of file fingerprinting. Um, and what this allows you to do is basically have a contents hash that will automatically generate on the file name. And that way you can set these things to cache them forever and ever and ever. And it will only change this file name as if new data gets applied to it, on the rehashes. And we do this now for our static sites. And we've got some, there's some grunt tools that can do this. Um, and obviously if you use something like, you know, Rails, it kind of magically works as part of the asset pipeline process. Um, so this is just an example of an Apache configuration file. Um, you know, you always want to have your default because otherwise Apache, the Apache default will be set and if you're not in control of that, you got to be careful. And then you can set everything else to kind of be quite a bit longer than we used to. Um, but this is just an example. We can walk through here. And the other the next thing I'll say is we need to choose our third party apps and libraries and services wisely. You wouldn't believe how many times I go look at something and when they say, hey, this is slow, and I'm like, well, do you need four analytics packages running? Do you, well, show me your JavaScript. Do you, do, okay, you've got six lines of JavaScript. Do you have to have jQuery? Is that really something that, I mean, we could reduce, you know, there's 30K right out the door if you just change this code and add three lines of non-JavaScript, you know, non-jQuery code. Um, you know, I, for so long, it was so easy just to dump more and more and more in. And these devices just don't play as nice when you start loading lots and lots and lots and lots of initialization for all these third-party services. So just choose wisely and ask yourself, is this really worth it? You know, one of the things that I'm constantly saying around the office, and everybody gives me crap for having my catchphrases, but I always ask, is the juice worth the squeeze? Why are we doing this, and is it going to provide better? And if it is, why can't we replace what we had? Um, obviously, we only want to serve the browser what is needed. And that's a big deal with responsive web design because there are some things that you just don't want to show on this device. One of the biggest sins that I see over and over with responsive web design is serving the exact same stuff to everybody and just hiding it with display none. That's a bad, bad thing. What you've just told the user is that I didn't want to do any additional work, so I'm going to make you download everything and I'm not going to show it to you. 
that's just crazy. And then with that, we conditionally load the extra stuff. Um, and that's OK. You know, as you scroll down, you can, you can pop things in. As things open, you can pop things in with the power of JavaScript. You know, and if you're worried about support for non-JavaScript, you can build in no script tags. If somebody is on a mobile device and has been silly enough to turn off their JavaScript, which I, I think that is not impossible with some of the browsers anymore, but regardless, you can do it. Um, then you put it in no script tags and it loads it in and they get a slower experience. But I'm guessing that their wonderful web experience is a little different anyway if they really are browsing without JavaScript. So um, that's OK. So home page image carousels. And I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here. I hate these things. I hate them. They just don't work. They are a content compromise. It's because you could not get someone to tell you what the most important thing was. There can only be one most important thing. The statistics are horrible. Less than 2% of people interact with these carousels on the home pages. That's not why they're there. Um, one of our guys actually came from Notre Dame, and I got a funny, little bit of a funny story. We hired a guy that was at Notre Dame working on their web team. And the next week, I flew out to speak at a conference. His boss was also speaking that I hired him. You know, He was from Dayton, but his boss was giving me a bunch of crap. But it was a really cool experience. I got to know him, and we had some shared experiences. And he wasn't really upset. I bought him a couple beers, and it all kind of went away. But he worked for Notre Dame's web team. And they have over 18 different websites that they've rolled out to all the different colleges and support and all that stuff. And he had statistics that they did some studies on their websites with homepage image carousels. And less than, you know, 1.6% of people were interacting with them. So he thought that once he had that data, he was going to go around and convince all the new people and all the people who had websites to get rid of them. Nobody did because nobody was willing to make the content decisions and actually have a backbone to say is, Sorry, this is more important than that. So they still continue to build them. They had one person out of the 16 actually say, yes, please make it go away. Um, this is one of my personal, you might know what this is. OK, this is flash of unstyled text. This has been called FOUT. This is that really funky thing when you land on a site. And uh, not to pick on Typekit, but they're an Adobe product now, so I guess it's OK. Um, <laughs> you know, it would go out, and the text would, would kind of flick in. And with some fonts, this is really, really, really obnoxious because the line wrapping can change. And the, the worst part is if you have your style text up in your navigation and you start changing that, this is just this is hokey to me. This looks unprofessional. And if you, one of the things that we've started doing is actually hosting all of our own fonts. Uh, there's a service out there that you can use, that you can pay for fonts and actually host them yourself. That way, they're coming off the same server that you don't have to do the extra DNS lookup on one of these devices to go to the third party, and it works really well. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about tools, and I've got some. We'll kind of walk through some of them. You know, these are just awesome. You can kind of get an idea of, you know, some of the tools that are out there, and a lot of them are just absolutely free. Um, you know, Pingdom. Has anybody ever used Pingdom? Um, they do a. Their main product is a monitoring service, right? And it works really well. And basically, you can write custom HTTP requests or even authenticated requests. And it'll analyze content on the page and basically just email you if it goes down. And I love that because I want to know if my client's sites go down before they do. <laughs> it makes me look like I'm on the ball if I can let them know or even put them on the email. Um, but they also have some tools that are on there. One of the things they have is they'll actually analyze performance of your page for you and give you a breakout of all the assets. Um, and I'll show that here in a minute. Um, Google PageSpeed is something that came out uh, several years ago, but got a major revamp last year. Um, at another conference I was at out west, I met one of the engineers who worked on this, who was telling me it was right before they rolled out their Apache plugin. Have you guys heard about this plugin that'll do some what at the time I was pretty sure was black magic? Um, it actually looks at your CSS and JavaScript and decides what's above the fold, the thing we were supposed to forget about, and, only, and inlines that into your HTML document so that you completely get rid of 
your um, blocking of CSS and JavaScript events. And I was like, you do what? And like, you build a patchy plugin for this that you want other people to install and run? He's like, well, yeah. I'm like, that is nuts. But anyway, there's this tool you can go out there. You can put your website URL in. It'll run some analytics. It'll actually give you a score for both desktop and mobile and give you what I think is pretty good actionable items. You can actually walk through the issues they give you and they kind of give you some help text of like things you can go change and actually make a difference without, it's a great way to kind of learn what some of the low hanging fruit is. Um, obviously, as web developers, we all use the web inspector all the time. It's got some great tools baked into it in the network section and just looking at what your requests and responses actually look like and what the latency was and where the time is. Um, I, I'm pretty sure as an industry that we've bought in to CSS preprocessors and I think that is fantastic. Um, I remember kind of after I got done doing the financial consulting kind of stuff and kind of came back and worked at a small shop on the web that the front end developers I was working with at the time, they would hear nothing about tools the CSS and the HTML documents they were producing, that was who they were. They were going to be judged by the community by them and they would not think about compressing them. They didn't even really want you to zip them up because they wanted the beautiful structure to show through. And it was like, okay, that's fine. I'm not, it's not a hill I'm gonna die on right now. But I, I think CSS preprocessors are gateway drugs for front end devs. You show them the power of what you can do with SAS, Less, Stylus, or any of the other ones that are out there, and all of a sudden their eyes get about this big, and they start seeing the magic of how to organize code and just do little plugins and things like that. And I really think that CSS preprocessors is what's fueling the current front end tooling revolution we're seeing um, with Grunt, and now there's Gulp, and you know, I mean, they're all between that, between CSS preprocessors and what Node.js has allowed us to do. Those two things have been the gasoline and fire that have ignited the front-end tooling um, revolution. And if you're interested in like front-end tooling stuff, we actually are starting a workshop um, called Front-end Tooling about kind of our process we use. I think week after next we're doing one in Dayton and it'll be throughout the country the rest of the year. Um, so let's go ahead and look at some examples of kind of what I mean when we talk about all these things. And I just want to say that all of the sites that I'm going to show except for the tools, they're sites that we did. I, I don't want any part of picking on somebody else's work. I don't understand their constraints. Um, I don't necessarily, wasn't there in the conversation. Um, you know, one of the things that we focus on at Sparkbox is adding value. And sometimes that means compromising. You know, one of the favorite quotes I heard last year was, you know, if you can't say no, you're not really collaborating. And that's important. So I don't want to pick on anybody else's you know, work. Um, so I'm not going to. Is this going to work if I do this, Kevin? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So this right here is a wonderful client we worked with a year and a half ago. Um, anybody familiar with the College of Mount St. Joe's? They're actually you know, down yonder. Um, and this is a really cool site. This is, there is about 2,000 content pages that we had to go through and do the audit and all kinds of other stuff. But what I want to talk about is this wonderful hero image slider, which I hate. Um, and actually, their content people refused to let me limit what images go in there. They put two to three meg images on these and then put a whole bunch of them. And it drives me crazy. And nobody interacts with this. It scrolls. But the first thing people do when they get to the site is they scroll down and want to see the content or start with the navigation. And as you can see, you know, the navigation up here, you know, it pushes everything down. It, it just gets it out of the way. Um, so one of the things that I think, and please, uh, before I show you this next thing and make any further recommendations, I am not a designer. The first person that tells somebody, well, Rob said to do this from a design perspective, they will get a nasty letter from me because I'm not a designer and I don't, I, that's not my thing. But I think there is some creative solutions you can use. And this is our new site. And instead of having that giant hero image, we built this thing with an SVG. It kind of animates and does some things. But this is really small. 
And I think this gives every bit of impact that some large, beautiful image is, or image would. And the same thing with another site done is this clearly communicates why you're here. And I think this is a great way to use hero images and to give that impact and to clearly state your vision and why someone cares to be there. Um, we've been trying to get more and more clients to kind of think about ways to not have these, to first identify their most important thing, but to not have those carousels that just drive me crazy. Um, this is an example of a site. This is that story.us site that I was talking about from the guy in Missouri, and he uses some ungodly large images, but they are such a huge part of his site. And this thing runs on WordPress. It's not all that snappy. But this is actually a case where hearing his why, that I was like, OK, you're going to have large images, and people are going to wait. But if you start looking at the content he's got, <laughs> it's worth waiting for. You're going to be here a while. You're not flipping around this site looking at the content. You're landing on a story and experiencing it. So this seemed to add to the experience. Yeah, I just, uh, he was telling me about these. And I was like, yeah, really? How long are your articles? And he said, no, no, no. Rob, they're long. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah. And he printed one off and brought this book to me. I'm like, OK, I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, so you know, one of the other things that you know, with this perceived performance is how do we move around the processing time a little bit? How do we, because sometimes things take longer on the server. If you go back and you, you ever notice when you sign into your Gmail account how it feels pretty snappy? And you're like, wow, they, how did they go to their data store, get all that data, and do all these things? And what they're actually doing is as you type in your email address and you tab down to the password, they send an asynchronous request out and they go start fetching stuff on the back end. And then they bring it forward to you once you've successfully authenticated. Not that you can get to it, they don't give it to you early. But they just have it ready to go and cached on the server. So as soon as you're authenticated, we can start pushing it down. So when we talk about perceived performance, one of the things we want to do is think about where can I hide the processing that has to be done? One of the obvious answers is authentication. Authentication, people are OK with waiting for a moment or two. Searching, complicated queries is another place. We can ask the user to wait a minute or two. So this is a app that um, we built uh, almost a year and a half ago, I guess, two years ago. Um, this is all Ember driven. Hey, Darren, what's going on, man? So anyway, what essentially happens here is you run your search. And this is a door-to-door -door application is what it's called. And what they do is they are retail energy sales. And they send all these people out in the field to go knock on doors. And they want to know um, if a house is a current customer, if they're a prospect, if they're not eligible because of certain other qualifications about them. And they can arm their entire sales staff with these iPads. They can show up and canvas an entire neighborhood and keep track of exactly where the salesperson is, who they've sold to, what contracts, what follow-up dates, and all those things. But essentially, what you'll notice is when I hit this search button, this is going back and hitting the server. This is a multi-part search that is using likes and is unbound. And it's looking over approximately 4.5 million records. This is a slow process. There is going to be pain involved when running this search. And they seem to accept that pretty well, because what we did is we loaded all the data we needed at search time. So when I go to view details, it's all snappy. I go update status. They were with a competitor. Uh, they're with Blue Star. And here we go. And what we're doing is we're firing off those asynchronous requests after the fact back to the, back to the server to update. Um, we want to edit their data. Let's make this, you know, this is my house, by the way. So let's just make this Rob. You know, now I can update the customer. And you can see everything is perceived quickly because we've loaded it all into the front end. And then just as easily as that, 
I go back and I've still got the prospects cached. We've made it feel fast. And it was amazing. Um, we actually, well, I actually had to talk them into not building a native I iPad app for this. They're like, it just won't be fast enough. And I was like, no, I think we can make it fast enough. Well, I don't know. I said, well, are you sure you want to buy iP iPads forever? You're never going to want an Android? What about using an iPhone or a Blackberry or a Galaxy or, you know, who knows? And they said, well, and I said, how about this? Time out. I said, give me two weeks to go build something for you. And it's not going to be done, but I, I think I can demonstrate the key parts of this to make it work. So just another example of that, and this is a JavaScript meetup, so I'm showing some of the JavaScript examples. It's something we built for CodeMash, not this past year, the year before. We were going to update it for CodeMash this year, but they turned off the JSON feed, and we couldn't get the uh, schedule anymore. But it works pretty much the same way, where you can go through and you know, add to your MASH board, and basically, I don't know if anybody remembers CodeMash last year, but the internet was horrendous. So this allowed you to basically download the app, and you download the JSON schedule that went with it, and it cached it, and you didn't have to have an internet connection to actually figure out where you wanted to go and where you were going. Um, we built this, um, I think, in 48 hours. We got there early on Monday night, and we were able to launch this. JMac was actually able to launch this, and... Um, at his lightning talk, say, hey, this is live. So we had 48 hours. We did all the dev and build it out. Um, you know, another project that we did recently is this for this wonderful lady that we work with who has this, she had this food this blog about freezer cooking. And then she decided to start selling membership, but she was still handwriting all the content and all this stuff like that. So she came to us about, about a year ago no, a year and a half ago now, and said, okay, I have this dream. You need to tell me if I'm stupid or if you can do this. And what it was is um, dynamically adding recipes together and figuring out cooking day instructions. So what she does is she takes between 10 and 20 recipes, combines them together, and she was handwriting instructions. She's like, well, can a computer do that for me? And I said, I said well, yeah. I said, I think so. Um, she said, well, you know, we talked about it. Um, I actually wrote a patent for this stuff that, I don't know how you feel about software patents. I'm not a huge fan, but that's what her lawyer advisor would do, so we helped write her patent. Um, and one of the things that came out of this was, you know, yeah, we can do it. And what's happened is, is you know, like, I'm sure everybody's in the room is like, how do you combine recipes? That doesn't make any sense. And it became this whole thing of, like, adding, adding more and more metadata and define buckets to be able to do this. But essentially, this is the same thing, you know, with, well, let's see here. Here we go. I'll delete this menu. Yeah. I can browse. And this goes back to her WordPress site that she's had for years. Um, and this is also an, an Ember app. You know, and here's the traditional stuff that she's always had. But now I can create my own menu and base it off one of the menus that already exists. And what it does is it allows me to very quickly swap recipes in and out. So now her, we've given her customers the ability to customize their menus if they don't like one of the recipes in there, that they can actually build it. And then we can dynamically build the instructions off that. So one of the things is, you know, you want to do, you know, this is all working with, if I spell pork right, that'll help. Um, this actually is loading in um, the searchable data is one big document. And then when I click the actual recipe, it's going and fetching just that recipe off the server. Yep. So there's, there's lots of, with these new, you know, JavaScript technologies and all of this, there's a lot more opportunity to find places to hide the complicated parts. Um, I know that, you know, I was talking to Jeremy Mack on the way down here. We were talking about, you know, architecting solutions in these, in Ember specifically, without any backend server at all, and how that would work, and what some of the so what some of the complicated tasks are to do in that world, um, using something like Firebase or all these other APIs. You know, I, I really think that if you're looking for a business idea, um, find a service that everybody needs: authentication, billing, um, sending emails you know, without having to do that and go build it for people who are building front-end apps because they're like, I think that's going to explode. Um, I don't know if it's the best thing in the world yet, but it's going to explode. <laughs> so, 
What? In more than one way, maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I, I tell you what, it's, it's interesting to me to, I mean, it's, what's the, the joke right now, like about JavaScript frameworks, right, or JavaScript tools? What's the worst thing that could happen to a JavaScript framework? <laughs> Six months. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there, there's gonna. The, I, I have a hard time denying that that's not the way things are moving for some solutions. Um, you know, so we looked at large assets, some hero replacements, client side caching, and I would be completely remiss in my responsibilities if I didn't talk about load testing just a tiny bit and just make mention of it. Please, please, please load test your applications. If you're writing things with server components, you don't know where your bottlenecks are until you put multiple clients on it. Even if you don't have to go, like back in the day we used Load Runner, Wiley's Load Runner, and it's, I know it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to get licensed and all this stuff. There is web tools um, that can do a pretty good job of this. One of my favorite is something called Load Impact. Um, and it's not cheap to use. It costs, when we run load tests, we'll spend probably you know, fifty to a hundred dollars in credits on load impact, but I can't tell you how much better it makes me feel for a client launching something and knowing that, you know, the six people we had concurrently using it during testing, you know, wasn't enough. And we found, you know, you never know where you're going to find those problems. It's you could have database bottlenecks. I mean, you know, one of the things we found on a project this past year is we actually found where we were causing locking to happen in our database. We we're calling deadlocks. And I don't know about you, but the scariest thing a web developer can see on a report when they get their data, when they, start, when they get a problem report, is the word deadlock. It just makes me freeze in my tracks. And the fact that we found that before launch just like was like, okay, this was totally worth it. And I told the client, and I went back and said, listen, we, we spent a day's worth of testing, and this, you know, in you know, $100 worth of credits, you're all going to be billed for, but this probably saved us a week's worth of time later. Um, so let's just look forward. What's next? You know, what's coming with all this stuff with responsive web performance? Um, I think that one of the things that's actually happening is something I like to refer to as a static site revolution. We're moving away from having CMSs and from having um, servers involved where we don't have to. Um, with things like Jekyll and Middleman and all these ways that we're building these tools building these sites, you know, based on content and then deploying them, that's awesome. Our new site that I just showed is the, all of the pages except for the blog is all static. We build it using our process and with handlebars and assemble. I think the, where's the, the assemble guy's here, back there in the corner. If you haven't talked to him before, this guy is a genius. He's, <laughs> he saved us so much time when we found assemble. Um, but this is really coming. And, you know, it's funny, like, I wrote this talk uh, over a year ago now. First time I get it, people were, people were like, no, you're not having static sites. That's not going to happen. It's happening. Have, you ever, have anybody heard of something called SiteLeaf? And they use liquid templates. It's a CMS that you use as a service that takes the custom templates and the handlebar kind of things and does replacements and builds the thing for you just like we would with Jekyll or these other tooling. So what we're starting to see is those static site management things that we all said, you know, six months ago that, hey, a client just can't do this. A client's not going to get on the command line and run grunt or run whatever the, you know, command is. Well, there's companies springing up that are starting to provide this to people. Um, client said side JS applications. Enough said, right? This is, this is where things are going, and I think that you know, it's okay. You know, I, I know that when this first started, we start talk, first started talking about this, you know, what was it, uh, you know, Backbone and all those other things. I know I was a little like, well, no, you're going to have accessibility problems and this, that, and the other. And, you know, there, there's dragons in here, and we're still in the middle of figuring out what this stuff is as an industry. And that's okay, and they're going to get better. And, you know, um, Jeremy and I were having a conversation the other day about this, and he looked at me and said, well, Ember is the answer. And I said, for now. <laughs> and I said, it's not because I don't believe in Ember. It's because I was around in the early 2000s when new JavaScript frameworks came out and iterated on each other. And do I think Ember is good? Yeah. Do I think that a year from now, will someone be able to take the lessons that the Ember community's learned 
and become more opinionated about how things are built and iterate on it again, it wouldn't surprise me. I, content strategy. I can't say enough about how much I love people who can get in the content and organize it and have data discussions about things people have feelings about. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, we have a young lady who does content strategy for us and the fact that she can go in to a client and a charge environment where everybody wants to think that their thing is the most important and work with them and just iterate with them and spiral through the process and just talk about, well, what is the most important thing and how do we get to it? And well, let's, well okay, uh, you just use the feeling word. Show me the data. Let's talk about the data. Let's talk about what's good for the organization. Um, so in the end, I think we want to focus on perceived performance and just care about it and find interesting ways to hide the gnarly bits that we have to do. Questions? Okay. Thanks. Um, if you guys want to have any questions about this, come up to me if you want to talk about anything else, smoky meat, business, Whatever, I'll be here for a few minutes. Thanks. Cool. Mm. Mm.